In the universe, wonders are never in short supply, and each one tells us a story about time, space, and our place among the stars. One such tale revolves around our closest celestial neighbor, the moon. This enigmatic satellite, accompanying Earth for billions of years, has captivated human attention throughout the ages. From the first shamans worshipping the moon to modern-day scientists probing its surface, it remains a key to understanding our past, present, and perhaps future. Here's the sun. It's in the center of our solar system. Mercury, Venus, and here's Earth and the moon. The Earth takes 365 days to orbit around the star. At the same time, the moon revolves around the Earth and completely orbits our planet in 27 days. The Earth creates a shadow zone, and sometimes the moon passes through it. The shadow is cone-shaped and gradually narrows. The moon is 238,000 miles away. That's like nine lengths of the equator. At this distance, the width of the shadow is about 2.6 times the width of the moon. When the moon is in this zone, direct sunlight doesn't reach it. That is, it should have disappeared, but instead it becomes red. All because the sun's rays pass through the Earth's atmosphere. They scatter and most of the blue light disappears. But the red and orange rays continue and hit the surface of the moon. Voila! You see a phenomenon called the blood moon. By the way, this curvature of light occurs at sunsets and dawns. The atmosphere scatters the blue light and you see a red and orange sky. If you were standing on the surface of the moon during a total lunar eclipse, planet Earth would be exactly between you and the sun, so you would be able to observe the solar eclipse. The surface of the Earth would become entirely dark for you. All you'd see would be the sun's corona illuminating the edges of the planet. The Earth from the surface of the moon is almost the same size as the moon from the surface of the Earth. Such a red eclipse of the moon is rare because several factors must coincide. One of them is that the moon must be full. Usually, you can see two total lunar eclipses a year. In 2038, you'll be able to see four such eclipses, and the eclipse itself can last up to 108 minutes. But this is rare, and the last time such a long blood moon was seen was in 2000. Many years ago, people didn't know so many facts about our satellite, and the sight of a red moon frightened them. It was a bad sign and a harbinger of trouble. People who knew the schedule of eclipses could take advantage of it. For example, Christopher Columbus had an astronomical almanac and knew when the next lunar eclipse would occur. He frightened the inhabitants of the Caribbean islands when he predicted the red moon. The moon is gravitationally locked with the Earth. That's why it is always turned to us with one side, like Mercury and the Sun. But the moon doesn't stand still. It's gradually moving away from our planet. About 1.5 in a year. Not quickly. But in about 600 million years, it will have shrunk in our sky so much that we won't be able to see lunar eclipses anymore. Do you see this crater? It's Tycho. It's visible during a full moon because of these bright rays that extend thousands of miles from its epicenter. This is the youngest crater on the moon. Scientists say it appeared there due to a meteorite impact about 109 million years ago. At that time, dinosaurs were roaming the surface of our planet, and they may have seen the impact. It was most likely accompanied by a big explosion and looked like a salute in the night sky. In wrapping up, our relationship with the moon is a testament to the beauty and mystery of our universe. Its patterns, movements, and influence on Earth serve as a reminder of the grand cosmic dance we're a part of. If you're intrigued by such celestial wonders, do consider subscribing for more insights into our incredible universe. The Moon, a beautiful, natural satellite with some mysterious dark splotches. We always see only one side of it, so we're used to this image. It's hard to imagine the Moon looking any other way. But it used to be different. Oh ho ho, it used to be so different. Picture this, a huge incandescent satellite in the sky that is causing constant tsunamis. I suggest we go very far into the past to see what the moon was like many, many years ago. The moon formed around 4.5 billion years ago. 
At that time, our green blue planet was still a red hot, insanely unstable piece of rock flying in space. We didn't have the moon yet, and a day on our planet only lasted six hours, which meant only three hours of daylight. Volcanoes erupted all over the place, releasing poisonous gas into the air, and a bunch of meteorites regularly crashed into the planet. At the same time, 4.5 billion years ago, the so called Big Splash occurred, or as scientists call it, the Giant Impact Hypothesis. It claims that once an object the size of Mars crashed into Earth. Mars is about two times as small as our planet, so the blow wasn't too bad, but it was quite catastrophic. This powerful impact tore off part of the outer layers of that Mars sized object and Earth. The very core of this space body merged with Earth's own dense core, and a huge number of fragments of Earth flew into outer space. So, this was the beginning of our moon, or, saying in a scientific way, the process of differentiation has begun. This is the process all planetary bodies go through at the beginning of their lives. Since the impact was very hot, its heat carried away most of the gases and liquids from the broken pieces of Earth. Only a relatively dry stone surface remained. So, yeah, there is water and gases on the Moon, but in very small quantities. The gravity of our planet was strong enough to make all these hot stone fragments stay in its orbit, and they gradually began to stick together. The chemicals they contained were distributed in layers. Iron, which was heavier, sank deeper inside, and lighter elements formed the surface. In a short time, a hundred years or less, the ring of steam, dust, and molten rock fused together. The largest clusters with the strongest gravity attracted more and more particles, gradually forming the moon. It looked like a red hot bubble ball. Sadly, the nucleus of this newborn moon turned out to be very small. It lacked iron and other heavy elements to form into something substantial, like a planet. The oldest rocks of the moon probably formed in the ocean of magma. And when the moon gradually cooled down, it turned out to be a white, clean, and perfectly even ball. But it was still completely different from what we have now. To begin with, immediately after its birth, the satellite was located at a distance of only 13,500 miles away from Earth. This is 15 times closer than it is now, around 238,000 miles. It's scary to imagine how huge and bright the moon looked in the sky at that moment. The view was probably both beautiful and terrifying. And, of course, such proximity caused incredibly huge waves on Earth. The planet experienced regular tsunamis. Also, at that time, the moon was spinning very fast, and it wasn't turned to Earth with only one side. But, in general, Earth and the moon had a positive impact on each other. For example, it was the moon that made our day last 24 hours. Now, Earth's axis is mostly tilted 23.5 degrees from the plane of its orbit around the Sun. Without the moon, Earth rotated rapidly. But thanks to the satellite, the planet's tilt stabilized, which led to a wide and pleasant variety of climates on Earth. To be fair, the gravity of our planet also helped the moon. Thanks to it, the moon began to rotate more and more slowly while gradually moving away from us. Over the years, its orbit has moved far away from our planet. At the same time, the moon became tidally locked to Earth. This means that its rotation period coincides with its orbital period. Or, in other words, the moon moves around itself as fast as it moves around the Earth. That's why the moon always faces our planet with only one side. When the moon moved away, tides on Earth became calmer. Now, water could flow to the most remote corners of our planet. It was then that life appeared on Earth. But back to the evolution of the moon itself. What was happening on its surface after its formation? The next stages of the moon's development were childhood and adolescence. And as is usually the case at this stage, this period was insane. No wonder, about 4 billion years ago, the solar system was going crazy. During the first 600 million years of the moon's existence, large asteroids and comets constantly collided with it. Now, they were bothering not only our Earth, but also its satellite. These impacts were the most powerful in the history of the Moon. 
They left many large craters, which were later filled with dark rock. So, Earth wasn't enough for you, huh, space? Once, a dwarf planet crashed into the moon. It was about the size of Ceres, the largest object in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. This explosion formed the SPA basin and also forever changed the appearance of the moon. Can you see that dark spot on the far side of the moon, right there in this very south? This spot is called the South Pole Aitken Basin. Its diameter is about 1,600 miles. And yes, it was formed by the impact I've mentioned about 4.3 billion years ago. This planet brought with it a bunch of complex and strange chemical compounds that scientists are now finding all over the far surface of the moon. These compounds began to emit a lot of heat, melted part of the lunar mantle, and, oops, accidentally woke up volcanoes. The volcanoes began to erupt furiously. A huge amount of magma was distributed over the surface of the moon. Many years later, it cooled down, leaving behind those famous dark splotches that we're so used to. They're called the Lunar Maria. There are much fewer craters there than on the lunar highlands. But for the last billion years, the moon has been geologically inactive, except for occasional collisions with meteorites. In general, the appearance of the moon changed forever as a result of these events, and, battered and tired, it entered adulthood. But even then, it couldn't get any peace. A bunch of meteorites decided to bother it again. Honestly, it wasn't that bad. There were many collisions, but all of them were quite small. They just left a bunch of craters and pits on the moon and maybe damaged its mantle a little. Some of the collisions deepened already existing large craters. The moon's crust was getting thinner and thinner over the years because of all the chaos going on. And now we call this upper part of the lunar crust covered with craters the lunar highlands. All those white and bright areas of the moon, the highlands. But in the end, the universe finally calmed down for now at least, and the moon began to look the way it does today. There are still many things we don't know about Earth's natural satellite. There are moments in its history that scientists still can't accurately explain, but they're continuing to study our beautiful satellite. The data about the moon is useful to people not only for its own sake, it gives us a more complete picture of both the history of our solar system and space as a whole. So, let's hope that one day, we'll be able to find out everything there is to know about the moon. You're on a plane heading to an important astronomy convention when you see a large figure outside your window that eclipses the whole sun. You spit out all of your coffee and everyone in the plane stares outside in shock. You then notice that it has rings like Saturn. You were supposed to fly to Japan, but you're forced to land in California. As soon as you land, you look up in the sky and see some more giant planet-like structures floating around in the sky. Everyone is taking pictures and trying to figure out what's going on. Suddenly, you notice a huge ball of fire crashing down near the airport. Everyone scrambles for safety, and luckily, it ends up in the middle of the runway with no one around. The bad news is there's no more runway for planes to land. Everyone huddles together for safety, and more large objects appear in the sky. All communications have ceased or broken down, since these large objects have ruined all the satellites. Some scientists nearby mention that these objects are the planets of the solar system going within the same proximity as our moon. Mercury and Venus look like moons, but Saturn is occupying a lot of sky real estate. You tell those scientists that you're an astronomer, they invite you to join them on a trip to Antarctica to the observatory station in the South Pole. They need every mind to help solve this mystery. You get on a ship with the coordinates set to Antarctica. The waves are extremely rough for typical daylight and non-stormy weather. You finally make it to the shore of the continent after a few days and have to get in a snowmobile all the way to Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station. Over here, you and a group of scientists will figure out what's going on. You weren't prepared for the freezing temperatures, even though it's July. You arrive at the station and see all your fellow scientists running around with paperwork and blurting out stuff about planets orbiting our atmosphere. You arrive at the conference room where the lead scientist explains what's going on. 
one by one, the planets are coming closer to us until they're aligned with the moon. But they still don't know why and how. Venus arrived first, and now Saturn is getting closer. The moon is around 240,000 miles away from Earth, and it affects the tides of the oceans and seas with its gravitational pull. Since water is less dense than land, we can see the tides change. So high tides occur when the Earth is pulled towards the moon. And since the other planets are coming closer to Earth, the gravitational pull is erratically changing. In a couple of hours, Saturn will be in the same distance as our moon. You head to the large telescope and observe the planets. Any plane or helicopter won't fly properly and won't have the proper radar technology to help it. You keep observing and notice Mars getting closer to Earth. You get news that tidal waves are rising very often now, and some island nations are even being washed away. Good thing they got evacuated beforehand. With Mars closing in, you notice Neptune also getting closer. You can feel the gravity on Earth fluctuate with every step you take. You report your findings to the lead scientist, and the only way for survival is to quickly build bunkers far away from oceans and seas that can host many people before the other planets close in. A team of engineers arrive and start building. Wave after wave of survivors come and settle into the bunkers, practically built overnight. With every hour, more planets are getting closer. Mars and Neptune have already settled in with Mercury, Venus, and Saturn. Pluto and Uranus are now visible to the unaided eye and are making their way towards Earth. The gravitational pull is getting completely out of hand. The snow in the Antarctic desert remains floating for several seconds whenever someone walks on it. You can jump a lot higher. It's now nighttime, but the sky isn't dark as usual. The planets are reflecting a lot more sunlight than our moon. It's barely visible now. With more observations, you notice comets and meteorites flying very close to our atmosphere. Some are even crashing down on Mars and Neptune. Everyone can see it from Earth. Other space debris also finds its way into Earth's atmosphere. But you notice something strange. The planets are now orbiting Saturn. You check your calculations and find out that the planet's positions are now aligned with Saturn's orbit. That's because it has the biggest mass among all the planets. Saturn's rings are made up of ice particles, some as large as a bus and others as tiny as pebbles. But they're all crashing and interfering with the other planets. No one can feel the orbit shift at first, but later you can start to feel it. With this happening, earthquakes and volcanoes are bound to happen. This is why everyone, including yourself, is packing up and ready to flee. Antarctica has dozens of volcanoes hidden beneath the frozen ice. Some are underground, while some are right on top. Saturn's gravitational pull is much stronger than Earth's gravitational pull on the moon. This will cause the inner core to react a lot more and kickstart those earthquakes and volcano eruptions. Everyone packs up super quick and heads to the choppers to fly to South Africa. These choppers were designed to have a direct course without the need for radars to guide them. You arrive in South Africa, which is mainly covered in water. The chopper takes you closer to the center, and then you travel to the Sahara Desert. The plain surface with nothing around it will be the best option for safety. But you look up in the sky and see another planet closing in. It's Jupiter, the biggest planet in our solar system. If Earth were the size of a grape, then Jupiter would be the size of a basketball. It's approaching quickly. Many of the other planets automatically make way for it, including Saturn. You're on the road heading to the Sahara, even though it'll take days to reach by car. The sky is dark during the day, since most planets are blocking the sun. You finally make it to the Sahara Desert with other scientists. And to your surprise, a whole city was erected in just a month when the planets started showing up. You settle in your dorm, but still have a lot of work to do. A couple of days later, Jupiter breaches the atmosphere and completely eclipses us. But Earth is now rotating around it. And it's much quicker than orbiting the Sun, since Jupiter is smaller. But since Saturn is also big, Earth keeps getting tossed from orbit to orbit, like two people playing a ball game with each other. So with that happening, people on Earth are experiencing different gravitational pulls from time to time. 
The tidal waves keep getting stronger, and volcanoes are erupting everywhere. Since the Earth's core is getting hotter, the temperature on Earth is also changing. And with a lack of sunlight most of the time, much of the plant life is having a hard time trying to keep up. Crops are harder to plant with natural sunlight, so people are turning to artificial lighting and greenhouses. Air and space travel are impossible. The International Space Station is completely ruined, along with the satellites orbiting space. That's why cell phones and the internet can't work. Gravity is even more dysfunctional than ever. Six months later, humanity has found some way of coping with the new normal, but things are constantly being updated. The number of hours in a day has changed, as well as days that compose a week. This used to be measured with the moon phases. A month used to be the moon achieving all phases from none to full moon, and so on. But Earth's moon has disappeared with the cluttered, disorganized planets.